Good morning, everyone. Um, the Biochemical Society and the Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Um, the topics in the series include different areas of molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. And each webinar will give you an opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics. Um, um, for the for the webinar series. I'm Jamie Blaser. I'm um, based at the University of York and it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session today. We've got three brilliant early career researchers who are going to present. Um, and the title for this one is Developments in Protein Function and Cell Behaviour. Um, before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked um, at the end of the webinar, uh, at, at the end, so we'll go through all three um, talks and um, then if you think of a question, just put it into the question box just as soon as it pops into your head um, and then at the end we'll ask all three of the speakers um, the, the questions that have accrued throughout the talks. Um, and so please make it clear who that your question is for. Um, when you put your question into the into the question box that you should be able to see on the side of the screen. So um, our first invited speaker today is Chris Horn from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. So Chris completed his PhD in 2019 working in the laboratory of Professor Ren Dodson at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, during his PhD, Chris unraveled the molecular details of gene regulation for sialic acid metabolism and bacteria, and through this program, he developed expertise in the areas of structural biology and protein biophysics, which notably led to a first author pu publication in Nature Communications. Um, in 2020, Chris moved to Melbourne and began working as a postdoctoral research um, fellow um, in the laboratory of Professor James Murphy. Um, his research now focuses on models, mechanisms, and molecular interactions of kinase and pseudokinase sidling proteins, including those that govern um, the necroptosis cell death pathway. But today we'll be hearing about the mechanism for the gene regulation of bacterial sialic, sialic acid metabolism. Thanks, Chris. Take it away. Um, thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. It's nice and late um, in Australia, but um, lovely to be here. So thank you to the Biochemical Society um, for giving me this opportunity. Um, so yeah, today I'm just going to share with you a little bit about sort of our characterization, um, work from my PhD on the um, mechanism of gene regulation for cytic acid metabolism um, in E. coli. <clears throat> uh, so cytic acid is the terminal amino with sugar. Um, it's present on cell surfaces. Can you see my screen? Yep, it's fine. Yeah, I can see. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so the most common um, derivative of uh, sialic acid is N-acetylneuronic acid or NU5AC. Um, and, but there's uh, less common forms of this uh, and they can contain sort of substitutions at the various hydroxyl groups, which you can see um, in red there. But uh, at least for the, the purpose of the talk today, um, NU5AC is my um, sialic acid of choice. So when cytic acid is cleaved and free in solution, um, such as within the human uh, gastrointestinal tract, bacteria can scavenge and import the cytic acid um, uh, and sort of do two, two things. One, it can serve as um, a system of nutrition or carbon, nitrogen, e energy, or um, the bacteria can coat their cell surfaces and kind of um, be quite crafty and sort of it serves as sort of, sort of a molecular um, mimicry or a, a, a camouflage to um, hide itself from the host's innate immune system. Uh, but both these processes, the catabolism and silation, is mediated uh, by gene regulation. So in E. coli, um, the gene regulator NANR, or the transcription or repressor NANR, uh, regulates the expression of proteins responsible for cytic acid uh, catabolism um, or an uptake, um, and it's, it's sort of represented by these sort of three operons um, you can see here. Um, which contain a highly conserved binding sequence of three GGTA TA repeats. And that's important um, uh, for the remainder of this talk. So NNR is a, is a GNTR type transcription regulator. 
Um, whereas most, of, so I guess it's quite unique in that respect because most of the other ones are this, uh, what's called a root R type. But really how it functions is, is quite simple really. I guess we have a DNA binding domain, we have an effect in the binding domain, and that effect of the binding domain can bind an effect of molecule, which in this case um, may or may not be cytic acid, but that causes an allosteric regulation that can sort of alleviate or modulate the DNA um, binding interaction. And I guess for this sort of project, we had sort of three main aims. One, that we wanted to look at the um, DNA binding kinetics and the stoichiometry of that um, DNA binding interaction. Um, two, we wanted to look at the cytic acid induced changes when that effector molecule is binding and sort of, I guess, deduce is cytic acid actually um, the effector of choice for this um, sort of system. And three, um, what were the conformational changes upon DNA binding? So uh, first and foremost, um, DNA binding kinetics and stoichiometry. So using a gel shift assay, <clears throat> we first fluorescently labeled DNA, which contained those three GG um, TAT repeats and titrated this against uh, NANA using uh, an yeah, electromobility shift assay or an IMSA gel shift uh, in short. And here we observed sort of the formation of three um, independent sort of complexes, which I've highlighted um, there relative to the DNA control. Um, but I guess this gel, yeah, gel shift assay sort of, you know, it indicates that we have three, but we don't really know what the stoichiometry of that is. So we turned to this uh, technique called um, analytical object centrifugation. Um, so this is an in-solution technique that combines the power of the centrifuge in order to analyze the sedimentation and uh, diffusion behavior of particles uh, in solution. And that can provide access to um, the size, to shape, um, molecular weight of the sample, um, depending on where it lies on the x-axis. Um, so essentially, the larger the molecule, the higher the number will be. But in this case, we use um, a technique called multi-wavelength, which is, um, I guess, a step up from the traditional sense that we can analyze um, a, a range of wavelengths. So I used 220 to 300, which would encompass, you know, sort of the, um, the spectrum of where DNA and both protein uh, would lie. But I guess the first point of this uh, sort of uh, thing is we would want to measure um, our controls. So we start this uh, process by, uh, yeah, sort of working out what um, NANA, the protein would look like. Um, so that's indicated in, uh, in, in blue there and the DNA um, in black. And this next bit is the part of the multi wavelength. So it's pretty tricky, but I'll, I'll try and work you through it. So each figure here represents the deconvoluted profile of NANA in blue and DNA in black. So the gray shaded area highlights where the peaks have co-migrated, um, which is consistent with heterocomplex um, formation. Um, so integrating the area of these regions provides the stoichiometry shown in the, uh, in the red boxes. So as we increase concentration from left to right, uh, the co-migrated regions shift to a higher S value. Uh, indicating that the complexes are getting larger, while the signal of free DNA decreases as more and more um, become bound to DNA. And this trend sort of continues as we increase the concentration of NANA even further, with um, even larger complexes forming, where eventually we see uh, a signal for free protein indicating that uh, the system has reached saturation. And we also see that um, the peak has narrowed, uh, well, yeah, become much more narrow in relation to others. So it's um, sort of indicative of that. So I guess to summarize, what we could uh, deduce from the experiment is we could see that three nano um, dimers bound sequentially to those um, GGTA, TA repeats uh, to form a multimeric assembly. Um, so having to find that stoichiometry, we next sought to sort of determine the um, affinity of NANA for DNA. So again, um, using that gel shift I showed you earlier, we could determine the ratio of bound versus um, unbound DNA by densitometry. Um, and this data was best fit to a Hill model, which gave um, a nanomole a KD and a Hill coefficient greater than one, which um, obviously supports cooperativity. But um, in a complementary experiment, we repeated this using um, that same sort of fluorescent tag DNA, like I mentioned uh, before, and used um, a technique of choice, um, AUC. 
Um, and this corroborated the result by the IMSA as three peaks um, were formed, so as you can see there, which I've highlighted. But um, and this sort of showed that, um, again, there was high affinity cooperativity um, uh, in that binding isosome. So although it's a different technique, the magnitude of those sort of, uh, that, that kinetics would, was, was very similar. So I was pretty happy with that. But I guess the question here is really what drives this cooperativity? We can see that's quite clear in the shape of that sigmoidal curve, but yeah, what is driving that? So I guess if you can take a um, sort of a, a dive into what the, the sequence of um, NANA is, um, in relation to sort of other transcription regulators, it has this unique N-terminal extension. Um, 32 residues, in fact, but what does this actually do? And does this mediate cooperativity? So um, if, to sort of just refresh your memories, you know, having this, the full length protein, we can see um, three complexes form. So we can uh, see three diamonds and NR form a hetero um, complex. But if we sort of chop this off, we actually found that we um, lost the ability to form that cooperative assembly. Um, as we only formed the um, the lower order complex, which is consistent with a role in mediating higher order oligomers through protein-protein interaction. <clears throat> and more on this, I guess, to come with some of the other data we have. Um, so I guess having answered uh, sort of what the, the kinetics and the stoichiometry was, um, we next sought to sort of work out what the cytic acid-induced changes was. So the question here was, does new vape AC attenuate the binding interaction, and, and yes, it did. So again, here's sort of our data I've shown you before from AUC, where um, in the absence, we can see um, these three complexes, but um, in the presence of cytic acid, um, that ability to form those was drastically reduced. And that's really indicated on, on the right, where um, I guess, so, so in red um, is a, 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 yeah, a shift to the right, which is indicative of um, a much lower um, binding affinity, um, which I guess uh, supports that we really do have a repression. Um, sometimes these transcription regulators can be activated, so if their affected molecule can bind and actually increase the affinity for DNA, but in this case, um, we certainly see that we have a repression. Um, so next to gain an atomic level insight, we solved the co-crystal structure um, of NANA in the presence of, um, of cytic acid which revealed that the um, nano forms an asymmetric domain swap dimer, uh, whereby the internal domain is exchanged between monomers through um, a flexible um, A4 linking helix in pink. <clears throat> so interestingly, this asymmetry um, in the structure um, in terms of the monomer bound to Mu5AC, uh, which is <clears throat> in sort of uh, tan or beige, if you like, um, allowed us to sort of probe the conformational changes. Um, but I should actually mention here that um, this, this structure was, um, was was quite tricky to solve, but what the um, ultimately the fact of that or, or ability to allow us to solve was this um, was this zinc molecule that was uh, present uh, in one of the monomers. <clears throat> so we could solve it by um, uh, by sad phasing. Um, but going back to the asymmetry, this allowed us, I guess, to sort of probe. Um, what the effect induced conformational changes were. So if you can overlay the two monomers, um, as you can see there, so um, in tan is, is with cyanic acid, in blue is without, um, and this illustrates that we sort of have <clears throat> um, sort of a, a restriction or sort of um, it's encompassing around that cyanic acid molecule, and then um, in the internal domain we have sort of a, a flicking out motion. And I guess another sort of um, another view of that is the surface illustration. We can see um, we can have a, a sort of a compression um, of the monomer um, in the new 5 ac bounds <clears throat> state relative to the um, solid acid free monomer. Um, so moving on to the conformational changes upon DNA binding. So we tried crystallography um, with this, with protein and DNA, many, many times, in fact, um, but it seemed to prove um, pretty um, tricky. So we turned to a technique, um, obviously, that's um, been very popular today, but cryo-EM, um, and this proved um, fairly successful um, for this process. 
So um, sort of shown here is, um, is electron micrograph. This was a number of years ago now. I guess if we did this now, it would be hopefully um, probably a lot better, but this is what we, we had with the technology at the time. <clears throat> um, but the 2D glass averages sort of show quite clearly that we had a dimer um, binding DNA, um, at least in the sense when we used just um, a strip of DNA that only had one DNA binding or one GGTA um, TA repeat. So that was quite powerful in the sense that, um, although I haven't shown it today, um, if we used um, either one, two or three, we could sort of control um, how many molecules were binding. But with that, if we only had one, the sort of cooperativity or the, um, the affinity was a lot lower. So it showed that cooperativity was key to form ultimately the, um, the hetero um, or hexameric assembly. So following 3D refinement of those uh, 2D club averages, we solved um, a structure of the 70 kilodalton um, lower order hetero complex to 3.9 angstroms. Um, and considering the small size of this complex, its dynamic nature um, and the lack of symmetry, the resolution of this model was um, was one of the smallest at the time, which was um, which was really cool. But um, like I said, I guess if we did this now or even reprocess, we could probably go further. But um, as it was, it really answered our question in terms of how it engages DNA. So it was um, it was yeah, it was awesome. <clears throat> so what do we learn from this? Uh, we can see that uh, Nano binds. DNA in an asymmetric pose um, relative to the DNA helix. And this um, binding was supported by um, SACs or small angle X-ray scattering. So for those who don't know, small angle X-ray scattering is an in-solution scattering technique where you can just um, add your protein. Um, in most cases, you put down a set column first, which can remove aggregates. Um, and then as it comes out of the column, um, you shoot it with X-rays and it scatters. And you can sort of, um, so that in that case, that would be the green dots. And then we can back calculate what we um, think the structure would be from cryo -EM, which is in black. And yet, as you can see, it overlays very well with that. So that sort of suggests that what we see with cryo -EM is, um, uh, is, yeah, what it would be in solution. So that's a nice confirmation. Um, and the density map, if we look a little bit closer, um, identify the minor and major groups of DNA, allowing visualization of the interaction between um, the uh, well, between nano and the DNA binding, uh, or the, the DNA um, helix itself. Um, and we also resolved several sort of um, putative DNA binding residues. So although 3.9 angstroms is sort of on the verge of um, resolving um, side chains, we could see a few, um, and I guess those sort of indicate that they're sort of the main um, contacts we would see with uh, uh, base pairs. But um, on the left, you can see that in green, um, we see like a much stronger interaction. We can sort of clearly resolve side chains, whereas in black, on the opposing monomer of the dimer, um, those are missing. So that's where the, the asymmetry um, sort of comes from. And I guess that suggests that there's a difference in binding affinity, which may sort of um, hint towards why we have that cooperativity in the first place. And like I said, um, in this case, we only had the one GGTA repeat. So I guess that's why we kind of seen that. But if we take those sort of um, things um, together, so the, the crystal structure um, and the cryo, the cryo EM structure, we can create a morph bottle. So that's what's shown here, where <clears throat> um, we can infer, I guess, um, what we like to call in our lab is the molecular um, choreography of, um, of how those um, domains rearrange. And I guess what we can see here is really um, the end terminal domains or DNA binding domains swing down to engage DNA um, when it sort of senses um, DNA in the environment. But really this sort of interaction is, um, is modulated by the alpha four helix or an untwisting motion of that alpha four helix. Now we took this one step further, um, and this was something I didn't really anticipate to um, be as fruitful as it was, but um, we had a bash at um, solving a complex of all three. So um, this is with the sort of, I guess, um, native DNA sequence where all three repeats of that as, um, are there or are present. Um, and although it's not um, 
the, the best resolution, we were able to solve an 8.3 angstrom structure um, that at least provided the topology of what the, the full um, hexameric structure would be. And you can see that quite clearly in the, um, the 2D class averages on the left. We can see three dimers engaging the DNA, uh, which is a 200 um, kilodalton complex in total. Um, the sort of the outer two were the, the, the beta resolved um, dimers. The middle was uh, the least, but that was really, in, um, I guess, resulting from uh, preferred orientation, unfortunately. But um, in terms of what we had, it sort of, I guess, provided some indication that we had the end terminal extensions. So if you think back to what drove that propensivity, I showed you if we chopped off that 32 residue extension, um, we lost that ability to form um, that complex, um, but we didn't really know how, um, at least at a structural or molecular level, how that sort of um, happened. Um, so uh, this structure kind of gave us a little bit of a hint of how that happened that I guess we just had protein and protein interactions to stabilize and, and tear the, the complex ultimately together. But this is something um, that uh, my supervisor, um, Reem Dobson, has um, ultimately tried to um, resolve with uh, cryo and, and, and cross-linking, <clears throat> I guess, with the increase in technology today. Um, so we can sort of, I guess, pull all this together now um, in terms of um, what we had learned from all those studies. So in, in the presence of DNA, we know we have these N-terminal extensions um, that can ultimately um, tether the complex together. We can see a change in conformation. We can see those internal domains swing down to engage DNA. And yeah, like I said, so in yellow is those internal um, extensions. They can, um, through protein-protein interactions, we think, um, yeah, can anchor the complex together. But if we have um, an effector molecule or allosteric modulator, which is in this case is uh, U5AC or cytic acid, um, that causes, I guess, a rearrangement of those um, internal dining domains. If it's necessarily in both, but at least in our case from the crystal structure, no matter how many times we soaked it um, with cytic acid, we only saw cytic acid in one monomer, which is quite um, weird, but um, it's biology. Uh, yeah, so that sort of created this sort of um, chance to sort of alleviate that interaction and ultimately disengage um, from the, the DNA binding <clears throat> uh, sequence. So I guess to wrap it all up, um, really like to thank my supervisor at the time, which was um, Ren Dobson at University of Canterbury. Um, Boris Demo, which is in the University of Lethbridge, was um, really key in driving the multi-wavelength um, analytical objectification um, experiments. Um, uh, and Harry um, Venkapal was was key in helping with uh, collecting and um, data processing for the cryo-EM structure at the time. Um, and if you want to learn more, uh, we published a structure or this um, story rather um, in, uh, in Nature Comms um, a couple of years ago now. But um, if you scan the QR code there, you can um, learn a bit more about it. Um, otherwise, um, feel free to email me or hit me up on uh, Twitter or X, I guess it's called these days. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions um, towards the end. Thanks for listening. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Chris. So we save all the questions for the end. So next up, we have um, Josephina Sampson. So hopefully Josephina will pop up in just a moment um, with her presentation. Here she is. Hi, <laughs> so Josephina earned her PhD in 2017 from the University of Leicester, working in Professor Andrew Fry's lab where she illustrated the role of HSP70 and uh, NEC6 in centro centrosome amplification and clustering in breast and hematological malignancies. She's now a research fellow working in um, Richard Bayliss's lab at the University of Leeds, where she is investigating the mechanisms of drug resistance and oncogenic signaling of EML4 ALK fusion in non-small cell lung cancer. Her research interest is focused on the characterization of relevant cellular and molecular events regulating compartment formation, signal transduction, and drug resistance of ALK-related oncogenic fusion proteins. So uh, today, Josephine is going to um, give us a talk called Understanding and Targeting Oncogenic Biomolecular Compartments of ALK Kinase. I can see
you and I can uh, can I hear can you say something Josephina can yeah I hear you? yeah yeah can you hear me yes of course Brilliant. Yeah. I can see you and I can hear you and I can see your presentation so please take Perfect. it away thank you thanks Jim for the kind introduction so um, it's a pleasure to present a piece of my work today here with you um, so I'm working basically on um, arc fusions um, and uh, today I want to just talk about um, a specific um, oncogenic arc fusion and how this it forms these um, biomolecular compartments, which they're basically these secular structures here. So um, the humans have around 58 receptor towers in kinases, and uh, um, here are illustrated in this schematic here. So we are particularly interested for the ones that they belong to the ALK kinase family. So these ones, they have these extracellular MAP domains, which they're legal, um, they, they allow the ligands to bind. And intracellularly, we have the tyrosine kinase um, um, domain. So upon uh, lichen binding to those domains, we have um, internal dimerization of the receptor. And this uh, has been found mainly predominantly activity in during the embryonic uh, development of the neurons. So ARC was basically first came into the, um, uh, into the light when it has been identified to have point mutations or amplification or fusion with a number of other proteins. So all of this, it kind of leads into activation of um, uh, oncogenic signaling uh, pathways um, that allow proliferation and cell survival. So in this basically talk today, I want just to focus on one specific um, oncogenic ALK fusion called EML4ALK. So um, it was first found in 2007, and this was a piece of the work that it was first identified, this oncogenic fusion, from a screening of patients with nosmocell cell lung cancer. So um, these uh, patients, they found to have this abnormal mutation, and when they isolate this um, and they uh, transform it into 3T3 cells and then into new demise, they could see that they developed lung cancer. So the EML4 is a microtubule protein. So it has this um, trimerization domain followed by a basic region. And then it has this tape domain, as we call it. So it's a tandem of beta atypical beta sheet um, propeller. So um, the EML4 it has functions in cytoskeletal um, uh, or architecture. And on the other hand, we have the ALK, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. And as I said earlier, it has these extracellular lethal domains and the tyrosine kinase in them uh, intracellularly. So this is where the breakpoint happens and allows the fusions to, ha to have. So um, in this schematic here, I just want to highlight that we have a range of different EML for ALK fusions identified so far. Um, in patients, and each of these, it has a different breakpoint. So we have um, breakpoints where the, fused, uh, the fusion has uh, completely lost of the tape domain or others that it has a partial tape. And this is what this schematic here shows. So variant one and variant two, they tend to have a partial tape domain, as we call it, um, where the three and five, they have a very, um, they completely lack or they have only few amino acids of this uh, tape domain. And that actually gives uh, differences in terms of the behavior of these oncogenic fusions um, in, in cells, but also in clinical trials um, and um, in, in patient of, in the treatment of the patients. So in this basically timeline, so ALK first um, identified through another fusion protein, another fusion partner called nucleophosphine in Hodgkin lymphoma in 1994. And then seven years later, it was discovery of the EML for ALK. And then since then, there was a rapid development of potent ALK inhibitors, which they are currently used for uh, the treatment of ALK positive patients. So in the case of the normal cell lung cancer, patients identified to be positive of this oncogenic fusion, they tend to receive seritinib or alectinib, um, uh, second generation ALK inhibitors, and that basically prolongs the survival of the patients up to 35 months. And when these patients, they stop respond, they receive a second line treatment with a rolatinib, a third generation ALK inhibitor, which um, it overcomes any resistance that uh, arise from the um, first, basically, um, treatment. So the median survival of the patients so at the moment is around seven years. And the majority of the patients that they are uh, diagnosed are under the age of 55. So um, going back into the molecular 
biology of these fusions. We, um, when I started this project, we didn't know much anyway. Um, this is a table that summarizes whatever basically we knew uh, up to that point. So we know that V1, V2, they are low in metastasis compared to three and five. Also, one and two, if you remember, they have this partial tape domain, so the protein is unstable compared to three and five. And we've seen also differences in terms of um, ALK inhibition, um, uh, either in patients or also um, uh, in in vitro work. So the question that um, uh, I, I had when I started this was, first of all, where these fusions they localize inside the cell, but also how they can activate downstream signaling. So the first part of this talk, I will try to address this, um, these two questions. So we overexpress the um, V1, V3 in cells, in HEC293 cells. And then when we overexpress them and we had a closer look on the microscopes, we could see that they form these cytoplasmic compartments. So in both cases, we've seen that there is um, a concentrated region of these eml 4 alk um, proteins. And when we look closely on these two images here, you can see that um, those compartments, they're able to come together and fuse. So we have quantified this in a number of different um, endogenous, overexpressed and inducible cell lines. And we've seen the same basically um, phenotypes where they um, have this um, cytoplasmic um, condensates or compartments. So looking more into um, understanding how those compartments they are, we uh, did some chemograph analysis. So we measure the movement of those compartments um, across the time. And we could see that in the V3, they tend to move faster and you have this kind of zigzag um, um, uh, chemograph where V1, they're, they're kind of um, didn't have much of the movement. So we can actually quantify the velocity of those um, cytoplasmic compartments. So um, we then um, got into the um, area of phase separation because um, we saw this distinct as, um, or, or region of, uh, of uh, EML for AL coming into these kind of compartments. And what we did, we used a hexandiol, a very toxic um, and aliphatic um, basically um, uh, compound that um, uh, we basically treated the cells with uh, five or 10% hexandiol and we could see no change of the um, compartments in the V1, but a significant loss in the V3. So we confirmed this data using another uh, two compounds called lipoid acid and lipomide. And with those, again, we've seen the same results. V1 has uh, no significant change compared to the V3, where it has a, a loss of these compartments. So um, we extended this doing into um, fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching uh, method in which we um, uh, frap and we bleach the compartments and then we measure the recovery of those uh, fluorescence. So what we've seen is that the V3 recover um, uh, much faster compared to V1, and we were able to kind of um, uh, measure this across the time, um, suggesting that V3, they are uh, far more dynamic than V1, which they tend to be uh, more like a solid um, compartment. So then we ask the question, okay, so they formed this cytoplasmic compartment, but what's the purpose um, of this in the, in the cancer cells? So um, we know that dml 4 alk is activating downstream signaling pathways. So we ask the question, does those compartments actually um, somehow or orchestrate the oncogenic signaling? And the answer is yes. So we have done a number of, of co-localization studies looking at adapter and signaling proteins co-localizing with the eml 4 alk uh, compartments in both endogenous and overexpressed um, cell line models. And we've seen that in both basically um, either endogenous or overexpressed system, we've seen basically um, a, a co-localization of the signaling proteins. So um, we have done basically a number of these, um, we have tested a number of these um, adapter and signaling proteins, and all of these are highlighted here, found to be within those compartments. And there was another study at the same time with our work that um, suggests exactly the same thing, and they show um, very similar data uh, with our stuff. So that was actually really important because I was suggesting that these compartments, there is a function why they are uh, within the cell. 
So can we actually disrupt those compartments and also what, how they form uh, initially? So to ask to address these questions, we used ALK inhibitors, which they, um, as I said earlier, they are currently used for the treatment of the uh, emf ALK patients. And we used sevitinib and rolatinib, um, second and third generation ALK inhibitors. And when we introduced them into cells, we could see that we lose the compartments and we have these bundles of um, inactive EML4 ALK, which suggests that it binds to the microtubules through the EML4 um, protein partner. Interestingly though, when we use the alectinib, um, a second generation ALK inhibitor, we've seen completely the opposite. So we see a very high number of those compartments that they um, uh, move within the, uh, within the cell. So um, in all of the cases, we've, we know that the ALK kinase is inactive. And that suggests that the activity of the kinase is important for the compartment formation. But for the alectinib, that was a special case and that was a different um, uh, basic scenario. So to understand this better, we use a STET, uh, which is basically a, a type of super resolution microscopy. And we visualize those compartments in cell. So we've seen that they have these cellular structures in which the signaling protein is um, within those cellular structures. And also, when we added the alectinib, which what, this is what we've seen with the movies um, in the previous slide, we've seen that those basically um, compartments, they are becoming much bigger. The wall of, the, of those compartments is becoming thinner and the signal proteins, they are trapped still within those compartments. So we can actually measure the diameter of this and we can see that the um, alectinib treated compartments, they're obviously much bigger compared to the control. So um, what was the importance of this? It was, uh, it was still not much known about it anyway. So we expanded this into uh, a more structural aspect of the project and we started looking into um, the structures that are already available in BTP um, with the alectinib bound into the ALK. So the alectinib here in magenta, it penetrates into the active site of ALK. Um, we highlighted lysine glutamic acid sol bridge the AC helix, the juxta membrane uh, domain, and the AL helix. And uh, we looked into the electron density maps. And what we've seen is that in the alectinib um, um, ALK structure, the uh, salt bridge, it, became, it, it basically becomes more like a, a stable salt bridge in close proximity compared when you uh, have the latinib, the third generation ALK inhibitor. And uh, that was suggesting that the alectinib is inactivating the kinase, but it promotes this active kinase conformation. So mimicking um, the activity of ALK. So we introduced also uh, further mutations on the ALK. So we made mutations on the salt bridge. We introduced a phalanine mutation, which um, this mutation was found uh, very frequently in neuroblastoma cancers. Um, we also introduced mutation in the R spine deletion of the juxta membrane, trying to understand how basically those EML for our compartments they are um, uh, formed in the in the concept of the active kinase conformation and the uh, and their importance. So uh, when we looked on the salt bridge mutation, we've seen that in all of the cases uh, with inhibitors and without, we lose the compartment, suggesting that the salt bridge is important for the compartment formation. When we introduce in this case the felonine, uh, the hyperactivating mutation of ALK, we've seen uh, the opposite. So we've seen a very high number of those compartments in all the three different inhibitors. So that was suggesting that you need a stable salt bridge and you need to have a felonine uh, core destabilized in order to have an active kinase conformation and subsequently the compartment formation. So is that all basically? Um, and the, the answer is, is no, because we, we are working in the concept of a fusion. So we always need to bear in mind the partner of this fusion. And in this case, the EML4 is, exists naturally as a trimer. So um, what we did is we uh, took the EML4 ALK and we replaced the ALK with a gyrase beam. So um, it's a DNA bacterial enzyme in which in addition of coumarmycin, it induces dimerization of gyrase B molecules. So we basically made this EML for ALK gyrase B uh, construct, introduced it into cells, and then when we added the coumarmycin, we could see um, a very high number of those compartments. 
So therefore, the dimerization of the Javis B is important, but you will need also the EML4 trimer to kind of promote further this uh, compartment formation. Also, we did the other way around. We uh, removed the, uh, the EML4 and we replaced it with the Javis B. And again, we've seen exactly the same thing. So we see a dimer dimer in this case forming this kind of condensates and compartment formation in cells. So this was actually suggesting that you need the kinase activity um, and the active kinase conformation of the kinase, but also the partner is important for the formation of these um, compartments. So the simple model that we put together is that we, in the concept of the V3 fusion, which is the short variant, we have the trimerization of the ML4 fused to the ALK tyrosine kinase, and that basically um, allows each basically um, EML4 uh, to have attached an, EM, uh, an ALK tyrosine kinase that uh, they come together and they dimerize to activate oncogenic signaling pathways. But the question that we have now is how those ALK molecules, they actually dimerize and how they can activate downstream signaling. So we made a number of mutations on the dimer interface. Um, so um, these are mutations done at the uh, beginning of the juxta membrane um, and also at the beginning of the kinase domain. So what we've seen is that uh, mutations here that they are at the beginning of the kinase domain, they uh, disrupt the compartments and you lose the compartments when you have those mutations compared to the juxta membrane domain uh, mutations. And also we've seen loss of the activity of the ALK um, in those um, uh, point mutations compared to the juxta membrane, suggesting that the active kinase dimer interface is not essential for the autophosphorylation of the kinase, but is required for the compartment formation. So um, we have a much further evidence now that there are other parts in the, apart from the kinase activity, that they are required for the compartment formation. So the question that we have and we're trying to address and, and have a whole picture is how those uh, EML for ALK compartments assemble. So we know that there are interactions between active ALK molecules in the compartments. So we have this dimerization happening between the ALK molecules. Um, and that basically allows the formation of these compartments. So we need more experimental and structural models to understand uh, the ALK dimer and, and find all the critical interactions required for this dimerization. And also um, the questions that we have is um, what, what else is required uh, for, for these uh, compartments to form, how signaling molecules they are contributed, and um, should we kind of stabilize or destabilize those compartments? And we need to find better tools that we can disrupt those condensates or compartments and not hexandiol. So the question that we have and, and we're trying to investigate further is, is it better to stabilize or destabilize compartments for the cancer therapy? So um, I will uh, wrap up this uh, short talk, which just give a model and the conclusions we have from uh, this piece of the work. So we know that the variant one, which is the long variant, and it has its partial tape domain, it has basically these uh, interactions happening in the trimerization domain. You have um, the interactions happening through the partial tape domain and ALK dimerization. All of this leading to the formation of those compartments, oncogenic signaling, um, and cell proliferation and survival. Um, in the case of the V3, which completely lacks the partial tail domains, the protein is much more stable, um, it's much more dynamic compared to the V1. And then we, we again have the same compartment forming that they recruit signaling proteins um, and therefore they allow as well the signaling to happen. So when we introduce ALK inhibitors, we are able to uh, either dissolve compartments or make them uh, more stable. And um, uh, what we basically know in terms of the sample of those compartments is you need to have the ALK kinase dimerization um, as an active kinase confirmation. You need to have the uh, uh, interactions happening of the partner protein, in this case, EML4. And therefore, um, all of this leads into a kind of um, uh, formation of a multi-complex interaction, intramolecular interactions forming uh, the condensates uh, or compartments itself. 
So uh, with this, I would like to thank Richard for working with his group. Um, the people who are actually helping with the ALK project, um, either in uh, mostly with the biochemical and structural aspect of the project, Mark, Nan, and Selena. Also, um, collaborators, which they help to uh, address lots of other questions in terms of the EML for ALK biology, um, which they are within UK or uh, internationally. Um, the bioimaging facility for helping with all the imaging that um, I have done and also um, our uh, sponsors uh, and funding bodies which they allow this uh, work to be done here um, at the University of Leeds. And uh, I'm happy to accept any questions at the end of, of this session. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Josephina. That was brilliant. So, um, yeah, we do questions at the end. And so last and not least, we will have um, Cassie Clark from the, um, it's no longer the Beadston Institute, it's now the CRUK Scotland Institute. Um, so, oh, there, there's Cassie, brilliant. And um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm handling all my uh, windows. Um, so after completing undergraduate degree in genetics at the University of Glasgow, Cassie moved to industry and worked for Visor for four years. Cassie then left industry to pursue a PhD at the uh, CRUK Beetson Institute, investigating the role of initiator methionine tRNA in cell migration and tumor growth, before completing a postdoc at the Paul O'Gorman Leukemia Research Center. Cassie is now an associate scientist at, at the CRUK Beetson Institute, also known as the uh, CRUK Scotland Institute, associated with the lab of Professor Jim Norman working on projects investigating metabolic drivers of metastasis. Cassie's interests include understanding how metabolism of cells of the tumor microenvironment can facilitate the metastatic process. Um, so um, I can see your presentation, Cassie. Um, and so today, Cassie will be presenting pyridine metabolism influences neutrophil behavior to prime the metastatic microenvironment. Um, so take it away, Cassie. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Um, and because this is quite a broad audience, I just wanted to start with a very general introduction. So I am a cancer researcher and one of the cancers that I focus on is breast cancer. And this is really, um, exempt the importance of this is exemplified by the fact that worldwide breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed cancer in women. And in terms of UK statistics, breast cancer is actually the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the UK. And this is even when considering cancers diagnosed across females. But what you may or may not be aware of is that the primary cause of cancer related disease is not diagnosis of the primary cancer itself, but a process called metastasis, where the cancer spreads from its original organ of origin to other sites through the body. In the case of breast cancer, the cancer can spread to the lungs, the liver, the bones and the brain. And currently in the UK, breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, 31 people every day. This equates to one woman every 45 minutes or over 11,000 women and 80 men every year. And so although there's been a huge amount of progress made recently in diagnosis and the treatment of breast cancer, there's obviously still a huge unmet clinical need that needs to be addressed. And so obviously cancers can progress through a variety of different mechanisms. And my research interests, including understanding how metabolic plasticity of cells of the microenvironment can facilitate the metastatic process. And so the project that I'm going to describe you for you today came from work that we originally instigated to characterize the circulating metabolome of metastatic breast cancer. And to do that, we used this mouse model of mammary cancer where we express the oncogene called polyomamilla T in the mammary epithelium. And this generates spontaneous mammary tumors that can metastasize to the lungs. So in collaboration with Karen Blythe's lab at the Scotland Institute, we took a large cohort of mice to the clinical endpoint, which is when one of these tumours reaches 15 millimetres in diameter. And from these mice, we gathered information regarding overall survival. We took quantitative measures of metastasis within the lungs. And I also performed metabolomics on the serum and the tumours of these mice. And with regards to the serum metabolomic data, one of the things that I wanted to understand is if we could identify metabolites that had significant correlations with metastasis, whether that be positive or negative, independent of any correlation with primary tumor burden. 
And indeed, that was the case. And one compound of interest that we identified was a compound called Gerasil. And this had a positive correlation with metastasis and no corresponding correlation with primary tumor burden. And so this is the data from that initial screen, and each of these dots represents an individual mouse from this cohort. And you can see we've got this positive correlation between circulating uracil levels and the number of lung metastasis in the mice. If we then group those tumor-bearing mice into those that don't have lung metastasis versus those with a high metastatic burden, you can see we've got this threefold increase in circulating uracil from 10 to 30 micromolar in the mice that have a high metastatic burden. Now, the enzyme responsible for generating uracil is an enzyme called uridine phosphorylase 1, or UPP1. And if we look at expression of UPP1 in human breast cancer patients, you can see that increased expression of UPP1, shown here in red, correlates with decreased um, survival in human breast cancer patients. And so at this, case, at, this, at this stage, we're really quite interested in understanding what could be a source of UPP1 in metastatic cancer. And one of our first indications of this came from parallel metabolomic characterizations that I was performing in acute inflammatory states. So in this case, I've dosed mice with LPS and then done metabolomics on the mice um, at various time points post-dosing. And in the serum metabolomic data, when we look at our pathway of interest, you can see that we've got this nice time-dependent decrease in the UPP1 substrate uridine and a time-dependent increase in the UPP1 product uracil showing that this pathway is upregulated in an active immune cell tone. We also had RNA sequencing available on the same um, model, and this sequencing was done on bulk sorted um, immune cells from the blood, spleen and bones. And when we interrogated this data for UPP1 expression, we found that UPP1 was specifically um, increased in the neutrophils of LPS treatment. Going back to our tumour model now, we can now recapitulate that by qPCR and we find that in neutrophils from tumour bearing mice, again, we have an increase in UPP1 expression compared to non tumour bearing controls, suggesting that neutrophils could be a source of UPP1 in metastatic cancer. So, obviously, there's a huge amount of literature associated with the roles of neutrophils in metastasis, and I've just highlighted two really beautiful examples from the lab of Larry Malanke and also from the work of Seth Koffelt. What these papers really highlight is that neutrophils play a very important role early in metastasis and within establishment of the pre-metastatic niche. So then one of the things that we wanted to understand is whether UPP1 expression could influence neutrophil behaviour specifically within the pre-metastatic niche. So in order to look at this, we use this tumour transplant model where we take tumour fragments and we transplant them into the mammary fat pad. And when the tumours get to a palpable size, we start dosing with our drug of interest. And in this case, we use a drug called BAU. This inhibits UPP1 and we can check it metabolically because we get increased uridine and decreased uracil in the serum and in the tissues of the mice. We then continue dosing the mice until the tumours reach a defined size that precedes metastasis. So we're very much working within the pre-metastatic space. And then we can look at our metastatic target organs of interest by either flow cytometry or by live cell imaging. And so this is an example of live cell imaging from a control animal. And you can see the neutrophils are highlighted in red and they're nicely along the lung endothelium. If you then compare that with the lungs of a mouse bearing a primary mammary tumour, you can see two striking differences. One is that there are many more neutrophils, and the second is that a large proportion of these neutrophils have a decreased uridine. And we've quantified this by a decrease in neutrophil speed. If you now compare that to a tumor bearing mouse treated with a UPP1 inhibitor, what you can see now is these neutrophils are again much more motile, and this is much more like the wild type situation. And we've quantified this as a rescue in neutrophil speed. So when we saw this result that inhibiting UPP1 in a tumor bearing mouse could have such a profound impact on neutrophil motility in the lung, we wanted to understand these neutrophils in more detail. So we've done that by flow cytometry, using quite a standard gating strategy to get to our neutrophils of interest. And then of these neutrophils, we look at the cell surface expression levels of a number of different markers of adhesion and activation. And one thing that we found that was consistently different CD11B. So CD11B is also known as integrin alpha M, and in addition to being a marker of activation, it's also an adhesion molecule. 
And what we find is that in the presence of a primary tumour, the neutrophils in the lungs have increased surface CD11B. And we think that the increased expression of this adhesion molecule on the cell surface could contribute to the flowing of neutrophils within that. Because if we then look at what happens in a tumor bearing mice treated with a UPP1 inhibitor, we no longer see that increase in CD11B and the motility of these neutrophils is restored. We've gone on to look at this motility effect in more detail, and we find that we can phenocopy the presence of a primary tumor by adding tumor derived cytokines such as GMCSF directly to the lung slices. And this decreases the neutrophil speed within those lung slices in the same way that the presence of a primary tumor. And in line with that, we also see that GMCSF can increase surface CD11B. And what we now see is then if we inhibit the availability of this surface CD11B at the cell surface by using a blocking antibody, we can then speed these neutrophils up again, showing that these alterations to surface CD11B that we see in vivo are actually causative of these motility effects that we see within the pre-metastatic. And so what I've shown you so far is that these UPP1 high neutrophils have high surface CD11B and they have a decreased motility. So as a consequence, we wanted to know how this kind of accumulation of slow moving neutrophils in the lung might affect the immune landscape of other cell types within the same tissue. So to look at that, we've done fly slot flow cytometry. And again, we can see now that in a UPP1 inhibitor treated tumor bearing mice, we get an increase in the number of CD4 positive people suggesting to us that UPP1 may actually influence the immunosuppressive function of neutrophils, or conversely, in the absence of UPP1, these neutrophils may be immunosuppressive. So this is all really novel, given that the canonical function of UPP1 is metabolic, in that it can liberate uracil and ribosome phosphate from uridine. So with this metabolic function in mind, we've done some metabolic labeling um, tracing experiments where we've added labeled uridine to neutrophils ex vivo and then traced it into the uracil product. And what we find is that the neutrophils can indeed produce uracil in a UPP1 dependent manner, but all of that uracil that they produce is really efficiently exported into the so with this in mind, I then wanted to understand how increased extracellular uracil may influence other cell types that we find within the microenvironment. So as a tool to start looking at that, I've plated fibroblasts in these different concentrations of uracil that we've measured in the mice. And then I've gone on to assess the extracellular matrix that those fibroblasts deposit on the fluorescence or by immunohistochemistry. And by immunofluorescence, we can see that the extracellular matrix that fibroblasts deposit in high extracellular uracil has a quantifiable increase in the amount of fibronectin that's deposited within that matrix. And we can really nicely visualize this by immunohistochemistry. And furthermore, this effect is really reinforced by looking at the recycling of the fibronectin receptor. So the rate of recycling of the fibronectin receptor through the endosomal compartment and back is, is, is very important in depositing these fibronectin neutrophils. And you can see that in the presence of increased extracellular uracil, we have an increase in recycling of alpha 5 beta 1, suggesting to us that the increased extracellular uracil that neutrophils produce can alter receptor trafficking and then also in a cell autonomous manner in cells of the microenvironment to influence ECM deposition. And this would be influencing ECM deposition in a way that would be permissive to setting up this kind of metastatic microenvironment. So then obviously one of our big overarching questions throughout this whole project has been to understand whether metastasis is altered in the presence and absence of UPP1. So we've looked at this in the context of our polyoma middle T cohort, and we find that overall survival is not significantly affected by UPP1. But this is because this survival is dictated by primary tumor burden. And in our hands, in this model, UPP1 does not influence primary tumor burden at clinical endpoint. However, really excitingly for us, what we do find is if we look in the lungs of these mice at clinical endpoint, we have a significant decrease in the proportion of mice that have metastasis in the absence of UPP1, suggesting that UPP1's role in cancer is indeed in facility. So I'd just like to finish with a summary. So I hope that you can appreciate that in the presence of a primary tumor, we have this increased neutrophilia. These neutrophils express UPP1, and we can quantify this increased circulating UPP1 as, as we get an increased neutrophilia during cancer progression. 
uracil correlates with metastasis and mechanistically we find that uracil can influence ECM deposition and that UPP1 high neutrophils have high surface CD11B, decreased motility and collectively these things could contribute to this immunosuppressed microenvironment that facilitates metastasis. And we find that if we inhibit UPP1, either phymologically or genetically, then we get decreased surface CD11B, we have an increased motility of these neutrophils, we get an increase in the, in the number of antitumor leukocytes within the lung, and as a consequence, we think that these mechanisms can contribute to this decreased metabolism. So, so now we're really quite excited about how we might translate these findings to the clinic, including understanding whether uracil can be used to identify patients at high risk of aggressive and metastatic disease, in addition to understanding whether using UPP1 inhibition in, in a neoadjuvant setting might increase the efficacy of immunotherapy. So I'd just like to finish there by thanking everybody that's been involved in this project. It's been hugely collaborative. Um, so many thanks to Jim Norman, um, my supervisor, who's been a huge support throughout all of my academic career. Declan White is a very talented postdoc that's worked really closely on this project with me. Um, all of our collaborators and our funders, and thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, Cassie. That was, that was fantastic. Um, so um, we have time for a few uh, questions. Um, we are scheduled to finish now, so we'll um, zip through. So hopefully there's some from the audience. Um, so I'm going to kick these off with um, asking Chris something. So maybe slightly weirdly, given I'm a structural biologist, I was actually particularly captivated by the AUC work that you did um, and presented on NANR. Um, I mean, it just it, AUC is one of those like techniques that's quite old school, but is incredibly powerful. I just wondered what the kind of sample requirements are. Um, yeah, good question. So um, yeah, the multi wavelength is is a newer technology, but in terms of um, I guess material, we really needed um, like I don't know microgram materials, but it really like maybe. Well, we used 200, uh, 100 micromolar um, of protein in the experiment. So um, you could you, you mixed the two together and and then run it um, across the entire wavelength spectrum. Um, uh, yeah, so it was not a lot. You needed 200 microliters of that. So um, in terms of um, the material, uh, you can recover it as well. So that's I guess a plus um, from AUC. Um, you don't want to let it sort of sediment too much that you can sort of sort of compress the molecules and maybe damage them, but um, ultimately you can um, recover. In a more simple experiment, you can get away with a lot less. You could sort of measure it like 220 nanometers and like measure sort of the um, sort of the amide bond um, for proteins. So um, yeah, in terms of accessibility, you don't need a lot. It's a simple answer to that question. Yeah, that, no, that, that. That's brilliant, thank you. And, and what was one of your um, proteins fluorescently target uh, tagged? Did you say, or we, we, did you just use the native um, proteins? I guess, I guess initially, um, so without the multi wavelength, we just used the fluorescent DNA. So we could just measure the DNA in that respect. So any shift um, relative to the DNA control would be um, indicative of complex formation. So that was just, I guess, a, a trick to sort of only focus on the the complex formation. <clears throat> we didn't have the multi wavelength instrument ourselves at University of Canterbury. We do now, but um, yeah, I had to, I went to Canada to do that uh, during my PhD. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and, and then the other question I, I, I had was um, for, for Josephina. Um, and you used STED um, microscopy, and I don't really know much about these different flavors of super resolution. I mean, is it a form of super resolution microscopy? Yeah. Yep. And so, what's the kind of advantage of, of of STED and the disadvantage, and why would you use that rather than something else? So, uh, STED is normally gives you a resolution of around 50 nanometers compared to a standard confocal microscope, which is around 200 to 300 nanometers anyway. So, it gives you a much more defined um, structures within the whatever you're looking to. But um, so here, the facility we we have a STED, a commercial STED microscope, and by the time that I was doing these experiments, it was the one we had here. 
So we're getting a new storm now microscope. <laughs> so um, my plan is to extend this into a storm um, my super res microscopy as well. Um, so, but it, it basically gives a much better resolution um, with the STED than the confocal. So we could see much more defined structures of those compartments. Um, so that was basically, um, yeah. Yeah, that's fan fantastic. Um, thank, thanks for that explanation. Um, so I can't see any um, questions from the audience, so I think I'll wrap things up um, now. So um, I'd just like to thank everyone for um, attending um, and particularly thank our speakers for giving three really excellent um, talks. Um, and indeed, you can continue the conversation online the Biochemical Society and Portland Press both have um, accounts on Twitter now known as X. Um, we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focus webinar series. Um, if you have an idea for a webinar in 2024, uh, we invite you to submit a pro proposal um, and you can find more about webinars um, and how to propose them on the Biochemistry um, Society website, which is biochemistry.org. Um, all, all of our upcoming webinars are listed on our website and if you've missed any of the 70 plus webinars that we've already run um, as part of the series you can watch them again um, on the YouTube channel. Um, the next um, webinar um, for our um, early career researchers is on clinical metabolism, exploring therapeutics and treatments which we've already heard a little bit of stuff in that kind of space in this one. Um, this session will explore the latest research into ischemia reperfusion injury, ALS, PMM2, CGG and Parkinson's disease with the aim of shedding light on potential um, therapeutics and treatment. Um, and finally, um, I would like to highlight that it's more, than, uh, more important than ever to stay connected um, and engage across the molecular bioscience field. And this is an important part of the Biochemical Society's um, function and this webinar series are, um, is contributing towards that. Um, the other things that the Biochemical Society do are provide things like summer studentships, which actually I held when I was an undergrad and were really important to my uh, professional development as an undergrad. And um, of course, um, the Biochemical Society also has journals that, um, that like the Biochemical Journal that, that um, offer rigorous um, venues for, for biochemical work. Um, and they also have a range of other grants and bursaries that they support. Um, so it'd be really, um, so it's a fantastic organization and these um, different um, activities really help glue lots of different er um, areas in our field together. Um, so anything people can do to support the society, particularly by applying for funds from them so they fulfill that purpose and also for sending their papers to biochemical society journals is really fantastic. Um, so that's all I have. I'd like to finish by saying thank you for our uh, to our three um, speakers and thank you for everyone attending. We actually had really good numbers I could see in uh, attending in the uh, control panel. Um, and um, Please don't close your browser, complete the survey that will follow this slide um, so that we can improve this webinar series um, the next time. So um, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.